be great pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Pat Patricia Sophie Meyer, who will be joining us virtually. Patricia Sophie Meyer is an MA student of Religious Studies and Japanese Studies at the University of Vienna in Austria and student assistant at the Department of Religious Studies. Her research interests uh, include religion in Japan, Western esotericism, gender and their intersections. Her first peer-reviewed article on discourse of religion and the cult debate in Japan is slated to be published this year. And the topic or the title of uh, Patricia's paper is Heirs of the Baphomet, Androgyny, Gender Transformation and Power in the Work of Alistair Crowley and Rosaline Norton. So Patricia, yes, I can see you've gone ahead and shared your screen. Thank you very much for that. And uh, you have the floor. Thank you for the introduction and hi to everyone on site in Amsterdam and online. Um, what I'm going to present to you today uh, under the aforementioned title is a work in progress, so I'm grateful for your comments and input. I would like to start with a few words on terminology. If I could just get this uh, pre presentation to, okay, there we go. I am following Carrie Weil's distinction between the androgen and the hermaphrodite. The term androgen is found in Plato's Symposium describing the original state of human beings as androgynous spheres that were split in half by Zeus, thus creating men and women. The androgen in this context was considered an ideal and harmonious state to be. The word hermaphrodite can be found in Ovid's Metamorphoses. When a nymph catches the sight of a beautiful man with the name Hermaphroditus, she's inflamed by passion and darts for him, praying to the gods to never be separated from him again. They grant her wish by fusing the two. Ovid describes the product of this fusion not as a perfect state of being, but as the exact opposite, since Hermaphroditus is only half a man after fusing with the nymph. Eliphas Levi's famous image of the Baphomet is laden with meaning. One of its aspects is a symbolization of the equilibrium of opposites. This is significant because it concerns masculinity and femininity as well. In his text, Dogme Rituel de l'Aute Magie, Liberium himself refers to Baphomet as an androgen and associates the image with wisdom and power. He considered androgyny the primal state of humans and the ideal state of being to attain. Levy's thoughts on the androgynous Baphomet are thus closer to Plato's androgen than Ovid's hermaphrodite. On a visual level, Levy describes the Baphomet as having a woman's breasts and the generative organs of a man, the caduceus serving as a depiction of the phallus. This is the imagery we are going to be looking for in the following two examples. I believe Aleister Crowley does not need much of an introduction, being one of the most eminent figures in esotericism of the recent past. The Book of the Law is one of the most important texts of Crowley's oeuvre, since it constitutes the foundation of his movement Thelema. Crowley claimed it was revealed to him by an discarnate entity named Iwas that he identified as his holy guardian angel or higher self in 1904. The text declares a new aeon, that of the androgynous Horus, in which the male principle of the aeon of Hadid before it and the female principle of the aeon of Nuit before that are fused. I was as considered an androgen by Crowley as well in Crowley's new comment on the Book of the Law. I was is depicted on the card titled The Aeon in Crowley's Tarot. The figure appears in a semi-transparent form looking directly back at the beholder. Looking closely, we notice the body of the androgen Iwas is modeled after Baphometian androgyny. We see the suggestion of a female chest over a small waist and male genitalia. Crowley also integrated the term Baphomet in his system. He identified it with the devil in the corresponding tarot card and called it, quote, the androgen who is the hieroglyph of arcane perfection. As we will see, this is the meaning Crowley applied to himself when he took the name Baphomet. When he reached the 10th degree of Ordo Templi Orientis, Crowley took the name of Baphomet. The office that came with this degree was Supreme and Holy King of Ireland, Ionia, and all the Britons within the Sanctuary of the Gnosis, or in plain English, Administrative Head of Odio for the United Kingdom, as Richard Kaczynski put it so nicely. The power this title holds is further reflected by the fact that Crowley as Baphomet is mentioned in the ritual of the Gnostic Mass, one of the central rites in Odio. It reads, and I believe in the serpent and the lion, mystery of mystery, in his name, Baphomet. 
that this reads like a creed not only reflects Christian practices, but may also be an allusion to the Templars who were believed to have worshiped Baphomet and who Ordo Templi Orientis claimed as their lineage. In his autobiography, we can find a fascinating interpretation of Crowley's body in the light of Baphometian androgyny. Speaking of himself in the third person, he writes, while his masculinity is above the normal, both physiologically and as witnessed by his powerful growth of beard, he has certain well-marked feminine characteristics. Not only are his limbs as slight and graceful as a girl's, but his breasts are, are developed to quite abnormal degree. There is thus a sort of hermaphroditism in his physical structure, and this is naturally expressed in his mind. But whereas, in most similar cases, the feminine qualities appear at the expense of manhood, in him, they are added to a perfectly normal masculine type. We encounter the, Baph the Baphomet's pattern of androgyny in this description with a female chest and male genitalia that are implied. The female characteristics serve as a kind of addition to an otherwise male body as Crowley is eager to stress, being that he believes female characteristics usually leave one merely half a man, as Ovid would say. Crowley then goes on to describe his female and his male aspects work together perfectly also on a mental level. The principal effect has been to enable him to understand the psychology of women, to look at any theory with comprehensive and impartial eyes, and to endow him with maternal instincts on spiritual planes. He has been able to philosophize about nature from the standpoint of a complete human being. Some phenomena will always be unintelligible to men as such, others to women as such. His argument here is clear. His androgyny enabled Crowley to reach heights of spiritual attainment that would forever, that would remain forever closed off to men and women. Let us now move on to Rosaline Norton. Norton was an Australian painter and occult practitioner. Her paintings prominently featured occult topics and images, some of which are significant for today's discussion. The most prominent deity in Norton's cosmology is Pan from Greek mythology. She explains the name, meaning all in Greek, by characterizing Pan as the ruler and god of this world, the totality of lives, elements, and forms of being. This applies to gender as well. Norton considered Baphomet to embody the androgynous aspect of Pan, suggesting that therefore, it is a more accurate pronoun. Of course, Putting an androgynous god at the top of her pantheon, Norton described power and eminence to androgyny. However, this is not the only instance of androgyny being connected to power. It is important to note that in the view of Norton, deities and other entities were not considered aspects of her own consciousness, but were independent beings that she therefore could not control or command. This explains why we will see that Norton did not claim androgyny by adopting a name, like Baphomet, for example, for herself. Norton frequently practiced astral travel. She considered it possible to change the form in which one appears in the astral realm. She puts it as follows, I quote, in the other realm, the structure of phenomena is based on other lines. Intelligences are not confined to one form as here. The latter material vehicle, as I have said, being fluid plasmic matter can and does alter its form to any image appropriate to the circumstances. Since, however, the form assumed is a direct reflection of the content or state of consciousness, it is an automatic result of the latter. In an interview for the University of Melbourne, Norton wrote that the concept of transformation in the astral realm covers gender expression as well. This is confirmed by letters written by one of her ritual partners we will turn to now. Norton practiced sexual magic with the Australian poet Gavin Greenlees and the English conductor and composer Eugene Goosens. Descriptions of their practices can be found in surviving letters. The letters reveal that when Goosens was working abroad, they practiced sexual magic together in the astral realm. In one of the letters, Goosens described that Greenlees appeared to him in female form while he, quote, was also in changing form, quote, which Marguerite Johnson argues, suggests that Norton also changed gender form. Since shortly before this statement, Goosens wrote that both Greenlees and Norton appeared to him in female form, this remains unclear. However, the fact that he pointed out that Norton appeared female suggests that this was not always the case. Furthermore, earlier in the same letter, Goosens wrote about contemplating her, quote, hermaphroditic organs in the pictures, quote. What pictures are meant here is not entirely clear. 
However, Norton frequently depicted elements of her own occult experiences in her artwork. And so two works that feature androgynous figures might give us a clue about how androgyny was understood in this context. The title of the first piece is Triumph. This work was part of a 1949 exhibition at the University of Melbourne, which was removed by police because its contents were considered indecent. We see a separation of the space in a dark half and a light colorful half. From the latter side, a commanding figure rises triumphantly to cut through the dark spheres with pure light. The depiction of power is undeniable. This figure shows the features that comprise Baphometian androgyny a female chest and male genitalia. In contrast to Crowley's depiction of androgyny, however, these characteristics are part of an otherwise female body. This is significant because Norton expressed to J.L. Murphy in the aforementioned interview the desire to have male genitalia. It is important to note that she did not want to transform into a man, thus leaving the rest of her body female. This is exactly what is depicted in Triumph. This connection is even more compelling in the second work. This picture with the title Individuation was part of the same exhibition, but was also removed by police for the same reasons. Norton explains that the work was inspired by C.G. Jung's concept of individuation. In her own words, she explained the work as depicting, quote, the unified self which contains all the opposites and polarization symbolized by the hermaphrodite figure, quote. Wehr explains Jung's concept of individuation as standing for the attainment of the goal of a lifelong spiritual psychical process of growth, that is, the archetype of the self. Thus, individuation clearly stands for spiritual attainment. On a visual level, the work depicts a largely anthropomorphic figure with cat ears, arms that turn into fish, and the wings and legs of an eagle, combining animals that inhabit the earth, water, and air. This can be understood as a means to symbolize containing the all in oneself. Of course, we also encounter Baphometian androgyny in this figure, a female chest and male genitalia. Again, the figure is at its base female, which corresponds to Norton's descriptions of her ideal body. In addition, Neville Drury has noted that the figure shown here is likely modeled upon herself, something she frequently practiced in her depictions of occult imagery. Even though there is much more to be discovered and discussed regarding this topic, allow me to make a few short concluding remarks. It has been shown how the Baphomet and especially its androgynous aspect was integrated in different ways into Crowley's and Norton's worldviews. What connects both is the fact that Baphometian androgyny was connected to motives of spiritual attainment and power. Another commonality is that both Crowley and Norton applied this androgyny to themselves. Their androgen is not only powerful, but also self-sufficient, meaning that no partner of the other sex is necessary to fuse with. In the case of Crowley, he added a female chest to an explicitly male body as described in his confessions. Norton, on the other hand, depicted her androgen as a woman's body with male genitalia. The androgyny of the Baphomet thus served as a template to reimagine their own bodies. The binary of male and female remains the point of reference used to constitute what the Baphometian androgen is. As a consequence, the implicit complementary compatibility of masculinity and femininity integral to the concept of the androgen remains unquestioned. Thank you very much.